Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ICG's Digital Academy webinar series. I'm Sally Alsop, the ICG committee member responsible for our webinar program. So for today's webinar, we're delighted to welcome Joachim Brecher, Director General of SMR, and Gabriella Custers, who's uh, marketing responsible for marketing for SMR. Um, and they will be sharing with us an update on the international research landscape, its key trends and complexities, and how SMR, your global membership association for research, insights and analytics, can help as you navigate this. The webinar will also include a Q&A session at the end. Uh, so if you have a question and would rather I read it out for you, please type it in the chat box. Otherwise, if you'd like to ask your question yourself, turn on your webcam and please raise your hand. So we're really grateful to Tenio Translations for sponsoring this webinar. The owner, Chris Barella, is an ICG member. Tenio is able to handle any size translation or interpreting assignment into any language and has broad experience of the market research sector. Before we begin, here are some more events we've got planned for you um, leading up to Christmas. Don't forget that we're able to offer great value sponsorship opportunities with each of our webinars and online events. Just contact Lucy if you want to know more. So now uh, I shall hand over to Joachim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sally. It's, it's my pleasure being here. Um, thank you in, on behalf of SOMAR for having such a, such a place to share our ideas and explain who we are. And um, yeah, so talking about the the landscape of research, I would like to to talk about three different topics. Um, first of all, the different trends that we are seeing uh, on different on three key areas. No, one area would be on the client side, uh, on the on the end user. Uh, there is a process of insourcing uh, that we are monitoring. Uh, the other one is technology for sure. Uh, technology and we we can comment some aspects on that and the and the third one i would like to understand is uh our, in our own practice quality and responsiveness of the audience and the public no so if if you allow me i i will go through them um on the insourcing side i mean the, the clients are living its own revolution as well i mean it's not only that uh the supply the supply side is evolving and very fastly, but on the end client side as well, and the end user. And also it has been driven by, by different aspects. One of those is uh, COVID had an impact. I mean, there was this realization that uh, the end user needed to have more constant updates on the evolution of the customers, of their customers and, and consumers, uh, evolution of preferences and likes and dislikes. So COVID in a way was uh, a game changer because there was this realization from the CEO and, and C-suite uh, establishment of need, this need of having more and constant feedback from customers and also the changes of trends and, and habits of consumers and needed that constant feedback. So what end clients or researchers have um, done in the past few years is get into this process of insourcing. Uh, insourcing also has uh, some challenges. No? Some challenges like, uh, first of all, uh, how well prepared uh, and clients are for this insourcing. It's not just the access to platforms that can allow the do-it-yourself option that uh, end clients will be uh, good in the service, so they need also to have some skills and some training and some some well prepared people in uh, ready for that. And this is one of the big questions: how well prepared end clients are for for this insourcing. The reality is that end clients and users are the ones determining the evolution of our industry. So it's by how they invest their money, where they put the money, that the market moves. On the other hand, as well, uh, in the last decade, there has been a huge investment of new money coming from outside the sector uh, that has transformed our industry quite massively. If we think of all this money that came uh, through technology investment, so uh, in this uh, past decade, startup uh, mode 
in which technology was the the real changer of doing things and technology that was developed in a way that uh, the technology developers found out that they were collecting data from people and they found out that the market that could be interested in having this data was our market. So suddenly in the last decade, we have encountered many new players, uh, many new players that have come into our domain uh, with no understanding or proper understanding or knowledge of what market research is and the practices that we have and they have had to adapt but the reality is that they have transformed our industry they have transformed uh, the shape of many companies if we think of the ownership ownership status of those companies and also the way companies are being monitored and evaluated uh, today uh, well these days particularly this week we we are following all this open AI um, CEO drama, if you want, uh, and, and, and it's I think it's quite uh, quite descriptive of, of what I'm mentioning here, which is that those companies looking for very high uh, value uh, value of their assets through technology and being very innovative in technology. So it has also come to our industry, and today. Uh, the evaluation of many of the big corporations in our in our industry is made from this finance and technology perspective. And today, uh, the, the finance leaders of the industry are really determining much of the the performance of of big companies. No? So that's that's had, had an effect. And of course, when I was mentioning a technology, I am thinking of all the new capabilities. That, that we have now in the industry. We can think, and this is something that I, I like to say in our events, for instance, that we were in Singapore two weeks ago in our, our Asia Pacific event. And, if, and the first Asia Pacific event was in 1991 in, in, in Hong Kong. And, and the reflection is, if we, if we could talk with uh, those people present in 1991, and that were in Hong Kong, and if they could have traveled in time in, uh, to Singapore this year, um, I am convinced that if they look at the program that we were delivering and the the exhibitor, the exhibition floor, uh, the exhibition floor with all the exhibitors, they could understand nothing. I mean, if, if suddenly they start talking about um, synthetic data, online panels, mobile panels, and many other topics. I'm sure that they would understand nothing of what we do because 1991 technology was far behind of where we are now. But they would certainly understand why we were there. They would certainly understand why we are doing the things we do, which in essence is to understand uh, people, to understand uh, people's behavior, preferences, likes, dislikes, and habits. So technology has had an immense, immense um, impact uh, in the last decade, and today is, is determining much of the many of the things we, we are doing for the good and also bringing some challenges. I mean, technology, I like to, to remind people that technology is an enabler. It's an enhancer of, of what we do. It, it must allow us to do um, better things, more things, uh, faster. I don't know if it's cheaper. I don't know if cheaper is, is the right word. Um, actually, I very much enjoyed a presentation in, in Singapore from, from this uh, professional from Coca-Cola, Atlanta, uh, questioning why Agile is linked to cheaper and faster. Uh, he was questioning, saying, no, Agile shouldn't be related to quicker, and, quicker and, and cheaper. It should be related to more iterative and uh, having a constant process of improvement of the idea or the concept or whatever. So in that in that sense, uh, technology as a big big enabler, a big uh, game changer, and a big enhancer of our activities, but also coming with some challenges you know, and challenges such as the ones I described before, when you join uh, technology platforms with the do-it-yourself uh, culture in many end clients, because um, we face the challenge of how well prepared. Uh, professionals are today in order to understand uh, where where are the red lines, uh, where what can what is the good and the bad things in the practice. 
And in that sense, I, I will refer to artificial intelligence as well. Artificial intelligence, uh, and I'm mentioning technology on many occasions in the last decade, we have seen some bubbles, no? some, some occasions in which uh, we have thought that that technology, uh, that aspect would change forever what we're doing. And in the end, it wasn't that case. It wasn't really that deep. The change, maybe it was a hype, maybe it was a fashion. Uh, of course, everything builds on the previous thing. So uh, the change uh, keeps happening, but maybe they were not that disruptive as we could have uh, thought at the moment. We believe that artificial intelligence is not that sort of hype. We believe that artificial intelligence is really a game changer on, on how we do things. Uh, on how we will work and it can bring many 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 good things and as well it brings challenges and this is why uh, for instance from SOMAR uh, the last year we have brought this topic in all our events we have brought this topic in congress in Amsterdam September was very much uh, treated also in LATAM in in Mexico in April and this couple of weeks these past two weeks in Singapore um, in Asia Pacific as well was uh, one of the main, main, main topics because we're at the phase of exploring and we're at the phase of exploration, understanding uh, what can be done, what cannot be done, what are the good approaches or the bad approaches. And from SOMR, we want to we want to foster this discussion. We want to to have uh, the different practitioners around the world and discuss on this topic because we all together we need to learn to. To see, to learn where what can be done, what cannot be done, where are the limits? Um, because, for instance, today, uh, very natural concepts for us, such as bias or representativity, or, or even algorithm, so accuracy, uh, even the same, same concept of accuracy, uh, or concepts that are very, very much into our uh, vocabulary and our practice. Today, they. They come with a new perspective. If we if we think, for instance, of of synthetic data, which had existed before, but today the way it is approached it can be a real game changer in the way we we supply uh, our panels or we supply our responses from for our studies, both qualitative and and quantitative. So we are in this phase of exploration of understanding the capabilities and understanding how far we can go with that and also uh, establishing some limits. Um, and the third uh, the third uh, big trend that I would like to mention, uh, it's on this quality side, on this side of the response respondents. And this is a, this is a, a big topic, particularly particularly in the United States. Uh, where the difficulty to get respondents is real, and there has been a process of uh, of less quality in the responses from from respondents, or directly fraud uh, with bots and different different methods of with the met methods of collecting rewards from people that are not real respondents. No, so so there is a. a a big, big challenge, and we also see that in Europe and in some other parts of the world, that uh, res the responsiveness from from panel participants or, or study participants is being more challenging, particularly in particular particular niches, uh, particular segments such as the youth. Um, it's getting more, more challenging. So uh, this is why also from the SMR and the coalition that SMR is with along with INSES Association, the MRS, uh, the RANS from New Zealand, or the the TRS from Australia, uh, the Ocean Association, and some other associations, Snapalcon, for instance, uh, we are tackling this topic of, um, of the Global Data Quality Initiative, which in essence wants to help the whole industry to elevate the bar of the quality standards and, and fight against uh, this fraud or this lack of responsiveness. So I, uh, in essence, before before uh, talking a bit more about the SOMAR, because I think it's good that that I can bring you the the perspective of what SOMAR is and why why we exist. I would like to highlight that these 
three main topics of insourcing from end client, uh, facilitated by all the, the do-it-yourself tools, the effect of technology and the challenges that we face for the good and, and for the more challenging parts, particularly with AI and this quality uh, initiative that I was mentioning. So if you allow, if there, there are no, is, I don't know if there is any question uh, at the moment, or you would like me to to present a small deck that I had prepared. Yeah, uh, Armour. Yes, Joaquin, thank you. Um, th th that was good to hear already as, as an introduction. Um, you mentioned synthetic data, and uh, I was in another webinar yesterday with one of your colleagues and I got a bit of an explanation of what it was, but I was quite unfamiliar with it. Um, so that might be the case for some other people here. I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit what you uh, see as examples of synthetic data. Okay, so synthetic data is has been very much used in, in the health uh, pharmaceutical uh, sector. So imagine, imagine that you have a special disease with very few cases and you want to, I mean, you want to find patterns of this disease. So what they do is they reproduce the real cases, so based on real people, real cases, and they reproduce their pattern of responses and behavior into, into um, or with uh, fake personas. So, so uh, imagine they take the real inputs and they create fake personas with the logic that these real people have used or are using no so imagine that that the same you are more you respond a number of of questions and uh, so we we get your your pattern of thinking we create a a new persona and now we totally remove the your identification so one of the advantages of of synthetic data is that all private information is removed so you can start playing and and asking questions to these new fake personas based on real people. And there are two sort of approaches. One is to have synthetic people. So for instance, when we talk about synthetic panels, is a panel composed by synthetic people. So it's based on real people. We create these fake personas and we play with them. Or, or um, synthetic responses, which is with real people, uh, we, uh, because we these people, we mirror these people to look alike people, and we uh, create synthetic responses to concrete questions. So the person is real, the profile of the person is real, but for a certain category that this person might not have responded nothing, we might attribute a response to that person based on the pattern of their logic. So, and, and is this where the large uh, lang language models come into play, like the prediction yeah. of what will be the next word logically following what was said before? Yeah, yeah. This is. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, so so I'll, so forgive me if I am if I am not getting too much detail or if, if something that I explain is not 100 percent correct. But but the there are new players coming in. Um, there is this discussion, and for instance, in the artificial intelligence forum we celebrate, we organized in in October in Amsterdam. Uh, there were real cases. Uh, in that case, from the qualitative approach, real cases comparing uh, the same focus group uh, done with real people or with uh, synthetic uh, people and synthetic uh, personas, how they differ and. Um, and, and starting to play and say, okay, when when it can be a good approach or what approach? One of the conclusions, for instance, in, in one particular case is the same study run in the US and the UK. In the US, it was very, quite very good, a very good approach as compared to the real people one, whereas in the UK it was totally bad. And yeah. the, reason, the reason was that the model was built uh, with uh, US data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I don't want to hold you up any longer. I think that was sort of quite clear. Thank you. Um, this is a big topic. Uh, and again, uh, th that's what I mentioned. We need to explore. I mean, we, we still don't have all the answers. We still don't have the limits. Because when when you create such fake personas, such synthetic personas, how long can you reuse them? 
No? How long is like is like if you cook uh, French fries, no? And you have the uh, the oil. How on how many different uh, how many different how do you call it? Sorry, how many different rotations can you have of that same oil? No? Uh, because it, it gets wasted. Any more questions uh, for your Kim before we move on to the marketing or the the uh, SMR information? I have a question, Joachim. Um, first of all, have, do you have any have any idea within your membership of how many micro or small businesses there are that are members of SMR? Uh, and also following on from that, what do you think these the, the impact of these trends will have on the on the micro businesses that, that work in market research? Okay, so I first one I can't really respond because we have indiv individual membership and and corporate membership, and I don't remember now the the data. Uh, I I can check. I can check and get back to you. Uh, and that's one. And, and the second the second one is very important, very interesting. Um, we organize at every event uh, different meetings. So when you when you see an event of SOMAR, like Congress or like this Asia Pacific Conference, we have different micro events in the event, which is one meeting with the local representatives of, of SOMAR. So we have more than 100 people representing SOMAR in 100 countries, more than 100 countries. So this is the person that, for instance, in the UK, we have three people. We have Crispin Bill, we have Lucy Davidson and Alex Whitley. These are the three representatives of SOMAR in the UK. And these are the people that bring us the reality of the UK which in that case, maybe it's not that needed because we're very close to the UK, but it's very much needed when we talk about Thailand or we talk about Zimbabwe or we talk about um, Bolivia, for instance. No? Right. Um, and then we have what we call the associations meeting. It's the same. So we meet with local associations uh, now in Asia Pacific with the Thai association, the Japanese, the Australians, uh, the Singaporean, of course. So we meet with them. And again, we discuss uh well how they see their markets what they are their needs and i will come i will get back to that in a in a moment the third one is what we call the clients the click meeting which is the clients meeting so we have uh, a special gathering with end clients and, and we talk with them um, and they talk among them sorry i mean they 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 have an agenda for instance the insourcing topic is one of the topics i always ask them to discuss uh, how how they are approaching the insourcing so on, and it's very interesting because you have you have uh, the end clients attending the event, and sometimes also end, end clients not attending the event, and and they have this open discussion because there is nobody in the room that is not end client, so they they talk freely, and and what I perceive is that for uh, well positioned boutiques or well positioned individuals that have a good understanding of the category. Good understanding of the client and of course a good, a good practice in market research they are quite well positioned in gaining this trust uh, of 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 the research research team of the in clients because in the in clients there is also as i mentioned a revolution uh, there is a revolution in sense of there is a transformation of the of the function within the clients there there is a real need of them being more vocal in the organization and having more influence. Uh, during the COVID time, many of them achieved this, many of them uh, because they showed that they were instrumental, that they were very useful. They really gained more weight within the organization. And some others need to have this process of gaining this weight. And what I have, what I see is that they, they really need to to get partners to find partners that can help them better understand and and predict their category so as micro companies or, or professionals if you can get this into this level of gaining the trust because you understand the category you understand uh, the reality of the company and and you can have a more consultative approach uh, i think there is a space Good. Any more questions from anyone before we move move on? No. Okay. Okay. Do you, do you have slides you want to show us, Joachim? Or, yeah. or I want to show you uh, if it's. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yeah. Sorry, I'm. I, I had to change the setup of my office, so I am. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I see. Okay. 
Okay, so I wanted to share, um, I mean, SOMAR is known, but not so well known. I mean, and I have Gabriela here, our head of marketing. Um, so everybody knows us for different purpose, different reasons. Uh, and and it's quite difficult to to get a compelling understanding of what SOMAR is. I, I always say that, I mean, I was president of SOMAR in 2019, 20, and I had been in the council uh, two terms before that. So, and I would say that I, I really understood this after being president. Uh, and now I am director general, but but after being president is when I, when I really understood this Omar uh, much better. No, so, uh, by the way, this is Edinburgh and uh, 2019, a very nice Congress we had before COVID. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the value proposition because I think by 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 sharing with you value proposition, you can much better understand what what the SOMAR is. It it has it was a working uh, reflection of different teams. Uh, I I always like to go to history because I think history explains a lot. And SOMAR was created in 1947 as um, as a response to the drama that Europe uh, live at the moment. Uh, professionals of the market and opinion and opinion research wanted to to get together uh, they understood that by uniting efforts from 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 each different country uh, and establishing these liaisons uh, it was a way of preventing of preventing uh, war again and they, this is something that happened in many many fields uh, of, of the industry so in 1947 SMR is created uh, in 1948 was the first Congress attended by 29 people, if I'm not wrong. And the funny fact is they were from from UK, France, from Italy, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Hungary, uh, Hungary, if I'm not wrong. And and from the Germ from Germany, I always I always explain one one funny fact that makes us realize how the world had changed is that the two members coming from Germany were British were British and they were uh, coming from the British um, uh, the British controlled area or region of Germany at that moment I mean the area of Bielefeld uh, where uh, a big the, the big data centers were established so the two delegates coming from Germany were British at that moment coming from Bielefeld then of course it changed and, and indeed we had we had a, um, we had a prime minister of Germany that was one of our keynote speakers in 1960 something or something like that because he had been working for GFK in the 30s. So yeah, so Germany is now a totally different story. But at that moment, I'd like to explain that. Oh, sorry, sorry I, I I had another meeting. Sorry, I I forgot. Um, so. So, uh, 1947, 1948, uh, today uh, we are impacting, uh, we, here we, we call about 40,000 professionals in our databases, we are, we, we are having uh, this, this big number of people impacted by our events and, and, and publications and, and everything. So, we need to have this reflection on, 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 the, on the value proposition, who we are, we are present in 130 countries, uh, we are no for profit associations, association, and we want to help individual and corporate members to achieve success. And you will see that repeated into the different slides. Um, very important to mention that SOMAR is powered by peers. So we are uh, professionals working for professionals to, to improve uh, the profession. Uh, we are global, international, dynamic, and evolving with membership uh, like the Insights Association is, Insights Industry is doing, as I mentioned, not for profit, and we serve both individual and corporate members. Um, this is a move that SOMAR did some years ago. Uh, traditionally, SOMAR was purely individual, but we understood that um, corporates also needed to be part of the membership, and this way we can have a larger footprint and reach to more professionals. Um, and our strength comes from the connection and collaboration with our members and industry peer groups. Um, so we have this mission of empower insights professionals to unlock their potential. Uh, professionals being individual, being teams, business, industry. So this is the mission with four, eight core uh, truths, which is that our members have the li our lifeblood, uh, personal growth for every single 
stage of the career. Uh, that's important. We need to focus on the young stage, but also on the different moments of our people's career. We want to serve the industry, uh, international, diverse, and locally relevant. I like to say always that we cannot be global if we are not local. Uh, ethics and integrity guide us so we can guide others. And this is the basis of our code of conduct, uh, ethics of the profession. Uh, never static, embracing constant evolution to ensure growth and leadership. Uh, human understanding is our passion. And uh, this is very important because on many occasions, and, and this one of the comments we receive is that uh, sometimes we have, uh, we're removing the word market research and talk more uh, about insights or about data and so on. I still talk about market research, I personally do. Uh, but when we talk about insights or data analytics, we always mention that we are not here to, to uh, analyze the data coming from a windmill or coming from a turbo engine. We're here to analyze data coming from human behavior and preferences. And insights and data uh, or data is our expertise. No? These are our truths. Our values, um, and in this world that um, values are the main principles to be guided with. Uh, so inclusive, uh, caring, giving, innovative, open-minded, courageous, rigorous, and trusted. Community is at the heart. Actually, we are now uh, working on the plan of 2024. Uh, the new council that was elected in April uh, uh, has brought a new strategy, and this strategy is uh, totally member focused. Uh, so thinking of our community, not only the current members of SMR, but also the ones that we aspire to, to, to embrace within our community. And also we, as, as, as association, we are not for profit, but we want businesses to, to prosper. Uh, we want the businesses of our members to go well and, and evolve. We see the industry as an ecosystem, an ecosystem uh, in which we we have these individuals that need to connect, to collaborate, and, and to grow uh, by talents, acquisition, skills, career development, but also very much focus on these business opportunities that that we create uh, by, by connecting people. Um, we see this ecosystem formed by suppliers of insights, data and research, the users and buyers, as I mentioned before, being fundamental because they are the ones fueling in the resources for the whole value value chain, and then the supporters, platforms, panel, techs, and investors. So these three main players that need to connect, collaborate, and, and grow, and we are growing as industry. Um, and we serve them by providing what we think they need. Also, we, we are running every year a membership survey. Um, yesterday, we released this year's one, so we, we, we are going to analyze it very briefly. So we uh, what, what people demand from us is connections, uh, personal and professional, uh, this business network opportunities uh, to grow, so accelerate growth, uh, team development, also helping recruitment for the teams, trusted knowledge and credibility. Uh, these are the six uh, main things that people are requesting from, from us, our members are requesting from us. Again, it's a lifetime value. So we think of the different stages of the career. And, and here, that's the, the, the chart I, I wanted to, to, to stop a bit. We already talk about mission. We already talk about why we exist, which is to connect insights professionals, to steward the industry, to drive the insights industry forward, to establish standards and provide guidance for ethical behavior. Uh, how we do it or what we do? Uh, we do it by strengthening, amplifying skills, facilitate these global peer networks connection opportunities. For instance, today, I, I, for me today, it's one of those moments in which I, I hope to, to get this connection with you. Uh, access to knowledge, expertise, and best practices, and develop future and nurture the industry future. How we do it? How do we do it? We do it for uh, by these global and local events connecting communities. So we have these global events that I mentioned before, but also we want to have local events. Uh, for instance, in the UK, in London, we tend to have two or three events, local events per, per year, organized by the local representatives. Um, leading industry training, uh, we also have the academy and, and virtual webinars for, for training, or we partner with different academies or universities. Uh, Created digital knowledge base, 
and I will mention that a bit later. Ethical standards, guideline support, and advocacy and lobbying as well, I will mention to that uh, later. This is just a, a summary of, of the global events, the creating knowledge, and the advisory support, training, and advocacy. And that's what I want to, to get into, because this is what I call normally the, the part of the moon that people do not see, which is um, we have, I, I, always, I always say the following, which is it is, it is not exclusive of SOMR to organize events on in, of insights, to have publications, to have webinars or training, um, to to create podcasts, to have exhibitors. It's not it's not exclusive to SOMR. What is exclusive to SOMR is to have uh, the global the global authority to to guard the code of conduct, the the, the international one along with International Chamber of Commerce, and also to have the, the authority to create the standards that are useful for the whole uh, practice around the globe. And the way we work is we have three different uh, committees that work in very specific uh, topics. For instance, we have um, the standards and compliance world, the advocacy world, and the capacity building. So on the standards and compliance, we have what we call the professional standards committee here, uh, which is uh, formed by members. Uh, so these members are researchers and their main mission is to be the guardian of the code of conduct and to create those standards and guidance. And, and we will see some examples of that. We also have, because we create the standard, we create the code. We also have this disciplinary committee and subcommittee which this committee is the ones that analyzes all the complaints that we can receive uh, when a member is accused of not following the code properly, uh, is, is accused of some unethical behavior or no compliance with the code. So we have, in order to make the code valuable, we also need to have these disciplinary processes. So we have uh, this disciplinary process in the professional standards domain. Then we have, uh, what we call the Legal Affairs Committee. Legal Affairs Committee is the one that works for the advocacy of the profession. It's composed by lawyers and data protection officers and public affairs officers from big corporations in the industry. And they are focused on government affairs to minimize any <coughs> legislative impact on our sector and also understand relevant legislation. They are scouting the legislation world. Um, I will give some examples on that later. And then we have what we call the Associations Executive Committee, which is uh, associations around the globe that uh, can elevate and, and we can exchange with them what are the different needs in different countries in terms of, um, of global support, best practices, also uh, requests for, for guidelines. Uh, so when, when we can exchange with the Germans, with the British, with uh, the Argentinians and, and, and different associations, what is their main uh, concern? And we assess whether we can help them, whether we can support, or maybe it's a it's a global need for, for the rest. So this is the way these three circles uh, interfit each other. Examples of what they are doing. Uh, so if we start with associations, we have the International Market Research Day. It's a day that we want to promote the profession. We want to elevate the voice. And this is a very nice day in which different local associations uh, together, they organize events or they promote uh, cases to, to, to showcase the value of research. Uh, we have a very nice initiative called Research Got Talent. Uh, this initiative that was born uh, in Hong Kong. So the local association of Hong Kong uh, elevated this initiative to become global and we just took it. Uh, it's an initiative by which uh, research, uh, so young professionals uh, below 30 years old, uh, they work with NGOs, with charities. So they work with them to understand what is their concern and, and find uh, potential solutions. Uh, with that, we have already worked with 68 charities and non-for-profit associations across the globe. And we are going to announce the winner of this year a contest uh, next week. And then we have uh, country overviews. For instance, we want to 
provide the basic information of every country that we are working with uh, in order to facilitate the, 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 the studies in those countries, to, to facilitate the, the international uh, study. Uh, we want people to have access to the basics of the information of a country. So this, this could be the, the Association Executives Committee. Yep. We have the Professional Standards Committee. Uh, this is the, the guardian of the code. Uh, recently, uh, it has been working on demographics. Again, in order to facilitate international studies across countries. So we are standardizing how to ask questions regarding gender, uh, yep. age, uh, pro uh, occupation. Uh, we are we are going to the different demographics in order to standardize them and and facilitate the 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 international studies. Online sample of thirty seven questions. This is fundamental. It was at uh, the beginning was twenty four questions that uh, a supply a buyer of sample could ask a supplier in order to check uh, the way they work and if they are enough quality uh, standards in their offer. So we have improved that, or we have increased from 24 to 28, and now 37 questions to facilitate uh, buyers uh, when they need to purchase sample. Now we are working on the same concept for artificial intelligence-based solutions. So in very briefly, we're going to release the 22 uh, questions that uh, a purchaser of an intelligence-based solution should ask the supplier. It's a way of creating standards, of creating a benchmark, and, and, and really understand what is what can be a good or bad supplier in that particular case. Uh, we are in this coalition I mentioned before on data quality and fighting against fraud with the uh, Insights Association of States, MRS in in UK and other countries with different associations. Um, we are working on, 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 for instance, on polling, uh, freedom of polling. We also are, are promoting the freedom of polling through studies uh, throughout yeah. the world. And of course, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, will need some guidelines. So we'll need to work on that. We have, we're start, start, um, starting with these 22 questions. And we need to review the code of conduct. So the code of conduct, the National Code of Conduct, I, uh, of SOMR and the Chamber of Commerce needs to be reviewed. Uh, so we are going to work and it's going to be a big project for this coming year. Also, all the all disciplinary uh, system and complaint system, we are constantly adjusting it to make it more, more uh, fluid and, 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 and faster. Not always easy, by the way. Yeah? There are some cases that are quite difficult. Uh, by the way, the chair of this committee, Professional Science Committee, is Judith Passingham, uh, British uh, professional uh, that has worked for Ipsos and Cantor for many years. The Legal Affairs Committee is the one that I, is working on advocacy. And somehow, I mean, a bit pompously, I mean, a bit blatantly, I, I like to say that is the, the shelter of the industry in the sense that it scouts different legislations and try to spot those legislation projects that could affect our industry. And I like to put a very clear example, which is for the European Union. The European Union is the most active legislator in the world. And that's why that's why we are <laughs> following quite closely what they do. But we want our aim is to, to cover the whole world. Huh? So we scout the whole world. And the, the most recent case we have been working on is the Geek Economy Project, um, a law project from the European Union by which Eventually, so it's a project that wants to regulate uh, the U the Ubers and deliverers of the world, and they want these companies consider uh, their collaborators as employees. So every every delivery uh, worker has to be considered as employee. One of the side effects of this law uh, could be that every respondent of our panels of, of our suppliers, every single respondent had to be considered as an employee of the company. So imagine the catastrophe that it would be that Dineta, Ipsos, uh, you know, Yugov, um, panel base you mentioned, had to consider every single respondent as a member of their payroll. That would have been a total catastrophe for our industry. So we have been loving 
with with uh, coalition to to prevent that. Uh, so we still we don't have the final result, but we are very positive that we are going to get that. We have been working on on the data protection and privacy, on data localization. We are working on on creating an exception, a general exception for market research to be treated as research, as scientific research. Uh, and by creating this exception, we would be automatically uh, ex uh, exempted from from different obligations, from different legislation. So that would be a very nice choker card for us. So we're working on that. And we are working on, on different aspects to prevent a harmful effect of the legislation into our profession. And these are the things that, that people don't see. These are the things that people don't see, but but we have this team working on that. Uh, this Legal Affairs Committee is being chaired by Kim Smouter, who was previously uh, an employee of, of SOMR, and, and he's very knowledgeable on this advocacy and lobbying uh, work that we need to do in front of the legislator. Uh, on the SOMR uh, AI initiative, I would like just to mention very briefly uh, what we're doing. We, are in, we, we pretend to inspire um, not only members, but the whole industry through thought leadership and, and sharing AI-driven innovations. Uh, we want to educate members uh, on the impact that AI can have on market research, the emerging trends, relevant techniques. <laughs> we want to share knowledge uh, with sharing best practices, the do's and the don'ts, AI use cases, as we did in Amsterdam and we do in conferences, uh, ethics, AI and governance, uh, we aim for a responsible AI and an ethical AI and a, an ethical use of AI in our industry. And our perspective, and also working with this advocacy team, uh, the legal affairs uh, team, um, they always say that we have very much work on privacy with the GDPR uh, compliance in the past uh, years. And we are very well prepared to do the jump into AI because it's very much linked AI with, with privacy. Uh, working on these reg regulatory frameworks, uh, for instance, we are also members of the ISO Global uh, Network, in which we are also working to adapt the ISO norm into the new uh, AI and technology environment. Uh, AI resources, so that's this professional standard committee uh, is producing these 22 questions for now. We need to advance and progress and, and see where are the needs for regulation, auto self-regulation, because SOMR believes in self-regulation. Uh, we have this SOMR task force uh, that's been created uh, in order to promote these, these discussions. And these are the channels, so the AI task force, the community circles for discussion, newsletters, webinars, or AI podcast. Uh, we have the community circle. And just lastly, as I wanted just to outstand that in our, our conferences, for instance, in SMR Congress in Amsterdam this year, uh, one of the papers that was most mentioned was uh, this comparison between ChatGPT uh, survey uh, versus um, a human uh, fully, uh, fully developed uh, survey. And so they were comparing results and, and when ChatGPT was good, when not, or who is better and when is better. Well, it's one of the takeouts. Or for instance, in Singapore, we had this huge uh, list of uh, pre presentations based on AI. So all these presentations, all these videos and papers, uh, they are in what we call ANA, which is our repository. And it's one of the, well, it might be the largest repository of market research uh, in the industry. Uh, we have all the conferences, papers, uh, podcasts, webinars, articles, and so on. Uh, so I just wanted to to give you a bit of an outlook of different things that we are providing. Uh, I could go for longer, but I think that would be a nice, a nice introduction. So I know if you have any questions, comments. I, th I think there were some uh, comments Thank you, Joachim. That was really interesting. Um, anybody got any questions that they want to ask? No? Okay. Um, Joachim, if if I, as a small micro business, um, was looking potentially to join SMR, what would you say were the key benefits, if you were to summarize in a few words, 
what would you think what are the key reasons why we should join smr and become part of your community i would say one uh i mean the, the most the most uh, tangible one is because you form part of a community uh today challenges are are quite important and being part of a community that is facilitating this understanding of how the how our industry is evolving what are the trends and and, and having the resources uh, not only with articles papers videos conferences but also you be you are part of a community and you also can help conforming this community uh, this community is not a community of big corporations it's a community of professionals as i mentioned so as a professional everybody has a say and everybody can really help conforming uh, how we need to work and where we need to head okay fantastic thank you i think liz has a question for you liz do you want to unmute yourself and Ask the question. Yeah. Thanks. I think Joachim will have seen me. I, I was at the SMR Singapore Congress for one day and it was really enjoyable. And I did ask a lot of questions, so he wouldn't be surprised about me asking questions again. Um, over the years, um, a number of um, ICG members have had some very difficult um, situations with uh, businesses claiming to be SMR members. Uh, usually about non or late payment. Um, how is SMR now approaching vetting member organisations when they join? And is this an issue that you're still seeing? I mean, essentially, are you expelling member organisations who do not meet the code of conduct or treat other members fairly? That's that's the that's the mission of these disciplinary committees I was mentioning. Uh, so so when it's proven that they are not following the code of conduct, they are expelled for sure. Um, the the process of of getting members on board, uh, we we are now revising it, and we are going to give again more more power to the local representative, the ones that know the market, uh, to really provide their inputs on what members or companies can become a member. Um, it's important to mention that SOMAR does not get into these payment controversies. SOMAR gets, in, um, gets when it's something related to the practice and to the proper uh, practice of the function, not into the payment, because we understand this is a commercial relationship, except for situations in which there is a repeated bad behavior uh of of bad payment from a member also the disciplinary committee can only have a jurisdiction on membership i mean we cannot really act if the company or the individual is not member of smr thanks i know that i when i joined quite recently i was asked to provide references to make sure i joined as an individual member i had to provide references from uh, from existing clients so i i'm aware that there are some vetting procedures in advice yes so, there are yeah so thank you <laughs> any more questions anyone no Lindsay. Yes, Lindsay. Hello. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. That was really helpful. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, um, but I'll ask it anyway. I was just curious on the proportion of um, client members that you have to the agency side or, or the platform okay. side, and also how that impacts on um, presentations of the various conferences that you hold. That's a very good question. Uh, so the majority is agency side, uh, that's for sure. I don't remember now the exact number of end client members. What I can tell you is the following: is for instance, uh, in Congress at Congress, we were about twelve hundred people. More than three hundred were end clients. In Asia Pacific, uh, twenty six percent of the attendees, we were around three hundred, were end clients. So we are increasing. We are increasing the the participation of end clients also on on the papers and the presentations. Um, Esomar does not select. I mean, Esomar the team we do not select the the papers that will be presented. There is a program committee composed by by agencies and end clients, and they select the papers. So the so it's a peer by peer 
selection. And there is a trend to promote uh, end clients participation on the stage. And so if you are if you are a, a, an agency or a researcher and you can bring an end client on the stage, you have many, much more opportunities to be selected because we want to promote the, the end client voice. And also we have even the special prizes this year for first time at events for end clients, because as I said, end clients are the ones that are fueling in the resources in the system. So we need to have them uh, close to us and we, have, we need to have them on board. So we are promoting more and more end clients uh, presence. And when I am, for instance, asked by a national association to recommend a speaker, I tend to recommend end clients to go as the speakers uh, because the more we speak with them, the more the more they are present in 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 events, and the more they can make their voice be heard, the better. Uh, so we we promote that. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? I think we have two minutes left. Time for just one more question, maybe. No. I think you seem to have answered everything for us, Yo Kim. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we're, we're wondering when when uh, will you be coming up with the guide guidelines and these 22 questions with regard to AI? And would it be possible for you to come back and talk to us about that when they are ready, when you're... you're yeah, really yeah it, can be, it can be me, it could be Judith Passingham, she's British, so, so her English will be more <laughs> closer to yours. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it will be soon. Uh, now it's under consultation, uh, most likely before the end of the year, if not early beginning of next year. So it's already under consultation with different stakeholders and uh, we will be published, yeah. Okay, so that's for the 22 questions. Yes. What about the, the guidelines? Ah, the guidelines still, I cannot tell you now because we are going to be focused on, so the 22 questions is our first response. And yeah. now we need to assess what should be the next one? What should be the next one? What is the market really requesting? and what is more needed. And also we need the practitioner's perspective. I mean, we do not have the answers. We yeah. are not the ones having the answers. We need to we need to bring together different practitioners that can provide uh, those answers and those guidelines. So it also takes some time to conform these groups and, and it's all very, very, very collaborative. I mean, we do not want to be like the, I mean, like the, we don't want to be Moses coming from, from the mount with the cult coming from God. We want it to be collaborative uh, with the expertise of, of the real experts, which are the practitioners. Okay. That's great. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. So thank you very much, Joachim and, and Gabriella, for joining us today. Oh, one quick question from Ini, maybe, before uh, before we go. Ini, did you want to ask something? I just wanted to say thank you. And also thank you for lobbying on our behalf. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's that's a, part, that's a hidden part that people don't know. But that's that's the one that we're investing quite a lot. Okay, brilliant. All right. Well, that's that's all we've got time for today. So thank you again, Joachim. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining today and do come back. We've got some more international focused webinars lined up for you in the new year. So um, do keep, watch this space and uh, hopefully we'll see SMR, somebody from SMR back soon to talk to us about AI and the 22 questions. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.